And Bonnie, I am happy to say, Bonnie Sitter is a friend. Um, we met through my mom, who was a farmerette, and uh, Bonnie came to interview her because she had written such a detailed, that four-page letter about her time as a farmerette. And when Bonnie met her, she could, she thought she was really good. Mom had an amazing memory. And so she was amazed at that. And when she found out their stories and their personal and their vocal history, they, they worked in farms in Cotton and um, Beansville area and up in Bedford near Grand Band and Pinery. And, uh, and so, so that's how we met. And I started sort of meeting her in Stratford. Bonnie comes from Exeter. And I'd meet her with pictures or papers from my mom and or books to deliver to people who had purchased them. And so we became good friends. We've been in the vehicle a bit and we've laughed a lot. Uh, so she's just an inspiration. She was a former travel agent, a photographer. She's got other books about uh, the bounty of Huron County, um, celebrating local history and local um, events that are worthy of remembering and, and, and documenting. And so she just loves that history and the local and personal, especially dear to her heart. She put out the, the published the Farm Red book because the women were getting older and she wanted them to actually see their stories in print. And so she's just had such a heart for them and met so many people. I'll let her tell you more. Um, her sense of humor, her compassion, um, the friendship, she just brings a lot. And she's so busy um, and in demand speaking. And she bailed us out. She bailed out a women's group that I worked with because our speaker had to cancel. And she bailed us out this time and just so cheerfully and so, yeah, sure, I can be there. And she's doing a million other things. So thank you so much for being here, Bonnie. And so excited to hear from you. Well, after an introduction like that and following um, the dog, and hard <laughs> acts <laughs> to follow. And uh, your music, Gareth, is uh, fabulous as well. So thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation to be here. Um, as Sherry mentioned, uh, we've become good friends through the Farmerette Association. Um, and if you happen to have seen um, the Zoom meeting we did, uh, talking about the Onion Skins and Peach Fuzz book, uh, the red book there, uh, Sherry's mother's story is in there. There's two letters that she wrote about her two years as a farmerette. And uh, this past Monday, Fourth Line Theatre, which is between Peterborough and Port Hope, made the announcement that um, the play developed from the book will premiere on July the 3rd, and it will be on stage 18 times uh, this summer uh, there. And we're hoping that uh, after the Board of Directors meets at the Bly Theatre, that they will possibly have it at Blythe as well. That's what I'm really hoping. It's a little bit closer for all of us. So um, today we're going to talk about the Wright family and the school car. And um, a few years ago when I was starting to research a book for um, a story about Fred Sloman, who was absolutely an amazing Canadian and was a school car teacher, um, I was talking to a girlfriend in Guelph, and she said, what are you up to, Bonnie? Uh, COVID was on, and I said, well, I'm, I'm researching the school car and the story of Fred Sloman. And all of a sudden, she said, oh, you, you've got to talk to Harvey Wright. He, was, he, he grew up in a school car, and my husband worked for him uh, first year after university. And uh, she said, I don't know his story, but I know he grew up in a school car. You have to find him. So she said, he lives in Guelph. So I, I found him did the Nancy Drew thing and I found him. And uh, he started telling me uh, about, about his life in the school car. And then he said, my sister wrote her, her memories about growing up in the school car. And I said, oh, would you ask her if I can read them? And he said, yes, I will. So a few days later, he called me back and he said, yes, she's, she's all set for you to, to read her memories, no problem. And uh, he met me in Stratford. He drove from Guelph and well, masked on and everything and hand things over. And I read the memories and I thought, wow, you know, it really touched me. I thought, you know, how many people know this part of Ontario's history? It's, you know, educational history. I don't think many people really know about it. So I said to Harvey, I think uh, 
those papers that your sister wrote need to be between covers. Uh, would you ask her if that would be possible? And, and he got right back to me. She lives in England, but you know, internet helps. And she said, absolutely, yeah, no problem. And I said, well, that means, Harvey, that now you have to write your memories and your two other siblings need to write theirs so that we can have the memories of the entire family. And the youngest one, Chris, um, he was the only one that was hesitant about doing it. He's, he was much shyer than the other uh, members of the family, but uh, worked on him long enough that he agreed. And uh, it's really a blessing that he did do them because he has since passed away, the youngest of the family. So um, yeah, we, we've got a story. So uh, this is what the school car looked like. And it was home to the teacher and his wife and any children that they, they might have. Now they, the Wrights had four children. Uh, the Slomans, you may have heard of the Slomans school car in Clinton. Uh, it's a museum there. They raised five children in theirs. Um, and the last birth was twins. Huh. Uh, I don't know, I mean, how on earth do you deal with twins in a uh, space that's like nine feet across and, you know, 30 feet long? Um, I mean, there's no place to hang diapers little and wash them, right? Um, talk, you know, you stand in the middle of the kitchen and you can touch anything you need, right? <laughs> Um, not much bigger, not much wider than the jail cell. I think jail cells are like eight feet. This was nine feet. So um, quite a life. Uh, the teacher had to uh, be somebody that understood the north and, and you know what life was like in the north. And he had you know if, if he got married and, and they all did, um, he had to have a wife that could could work with that same situation, the isolation. Uh, from uh, you know going into a store and and picking up what you need you know well, or picking up your mail or visiting at the post office things like that 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 didn't happen so uh, that's where they lived and the program started in 1926 and continued till 1967 and this was the last of the school cars to be still uh, doing the route. And it was retired in 1967, and it's now in a, muse a rail museum just outside of Montreal. Okay, so, you know, who thought this up? Well, Dr. J.B. McDougall thought it up. And he came um, as a young child from Scotland and lived in the, um, in the Ottawa area. And he was very clever at school and um, went, to, went to teacher's college, at that time it was called a model school, but then he, he earned a scholarship and went to Queen's and studied further. Um, quite, quite a, I mean you could write a, a book just about this man, but one day, this is a story and I think, it's, I think it's true, one day when he was searching for um, a way to educate the children in northern Ontario, he saw a freight train shuttling uh, some cars onto a spur line and he thought Eureka that's how we can do it uh, we we make accommodation for a classroom and the, and the teacher in a converted passenger car and the kids don't go to the school the school goes to the children so uh, this is the man that is credited uh, with figuring how to make that happen and here's Bill Wright. And Bill Wright uh, graduated from uh, normal school, model school, uh, in uh, North Bay. And, you know, one day uh, near the end, of, just before he graduated, uh, the teacher said to him, um, you know, you should possibly look at the fact that there's school cars. You don't have to be just in a one-room school in Northern Ontario. And, um, and eventually, uh, a place became available in 1928, he, two years after the program started, which was a six-month experiment, by the way. Uh, he found himself uh, going to collect his school car. So um, he handed over the papers, and said, you know, he was the one that was supposed to um, get the keys for the school car. 
and uh, showed the telegram to the man, and <clears throat> the man says, I'll get the keys, and you know, walked over to him and said, she's all yours. <laughs> and no instructions. You know? <laughs> so, um, and you, you were not just a teacher, you were the janitor, you were the one that made everything work. You, there was no phones that you were gonna call somebody and say, you know, how, how do I like this, or you know, what, what, how do I fix this, whatever. Um, so, not just the children's memories are in this book. Um, letters that uh, Bill wrote to his parents, you know, saying, you know, the scribbly writing because I'm, you know, the train's moving or, you know, as it's going along, that sort of thing. So there's memories there as well. But um, the first few years he was on his own and then uh, he went home to uh, visit in the summertime and discovered that his uh, <coughs> parents had this beautiful teacher boarding with them. And uh, she had come from the uh, Campbellford area of Ontario. Anyway, romance followed and they were eventually married. And at about the same time, the, um, the route uh, <coughs> changed from what, what Bill had been teaching. And I'll show you a picture of that. It'll be coming up here. Okay, so Chris on the left is the one that uh, passed away uh, a year ago. And then uh, the one that lives in England is next to him. And then Nancy and then Harvey uh, on the right, the one that lives in, in Guelph. So there's uh, this uh, school car routes. And the one that we're most concerned with today is the one from Shaplo. So you can see where uh, Cape Creole and Sudbury are. So uh, Shaplo to White River was the route. So it would go, they would teach for maybe four or five days, uh, review the, the, um, the homework that they had been given, and then um, they would um, be taught new things, and then they would be handed four weeks of homework. <laughs> so, I mean, the teacher's job was immense. Yeah. Um, you think, well, you know, this, you know, this must have been a real cinch, you know, teaching, you know, just sometimes there was three kids, sometimes there were eight but all, all different uh, age groups. So yeah. uh, quite, a, quite a challenge. And, and the children were just so excited. Um, they loved going to school. I mean, you know, the news spread pretty quickly. The school car is coming, the school car is coming. And uh, when the, the teacher left, they were pretty, pretty sad to see the teacher go. They knew it was a lot of, you know, a lot of weeks that was gonna pass before he was back. But, you know, the system worked and, um, the uh, Slomans that I mentioned, let's see if I can get in, uh, their route was from Cape Real up to Foliet. So both CN and CP worked with the Department of Education uh, to make this program work. So this is a, a little bit easier maybe to see. Um, so Shaco at the bottom right hand corner. So there was the name of the places where the uh, school car stopped. And it was usually near um, uh, a lake or a river, because that's where they got their water. Even in the winter time, the ice had to be broken and the pails of water dipped in um, and taken and carried back to the school car. So a little bit of history there. And probably the, the thing that's um, most important, uh, in 1871, because the school act said that every child was given, was supposed to be given education in a government inspected school. That these people were so remote, there was no way that you could build a school and make, it, make that system work. Um, if people would be there, and then next year they would be on, move someplace else in Northern Ontario. So this was, this was set up, um, the children you know, might walk two miles out of the bush and then walk two miles down the railroad track to get to school. Uh, there was nothing simple about it, but um, they, they loved it once they learned what it was all about. And most of the, most of the children were from uh, immigrant families from uh, Italy and Poland and Scandinavia. Um, and nobody was speaking English, so 
talk about a challenge. <laughs> First, you've got to teach them English before you can teach them how you know how to how to read and do do arithmetic and all the other things. So a big challenge. Now on that map, uh, a minute ago, uh, the Chapel Game Reserve um, is is drawn on the map, and um, there's no hunting allowed there. And one of Bill's letters, uh, <laughs> or maybe it was one of the, the children said the story was that their dad had taken his rifle out to go hunting and had had wandered into the game preserve and got caught and uh, his gun was confiscated and uh, you know that ended that and you know and he hadn't done it intentionally and it, you know he was pretty unhappy about you know that I mean they would they would go out hunting for grouse and whatnot just along the tracks right um, you know he didn't need to go into the game reserve to go hunting but um, uh, it's a, it's a huge huge one of the biggest game preserves in in the world actually. Most people have probably never heard of the Chapel Game Reserve. I have never heard of it. And then White River is because of, uh, people know that name because of Winnie the Pooh, so. <laughs> so some facts and figures for you. Um, 52 feet long, so in the, in the classroom uh, part of the school, there was, um, Usually 12 desks, six smaller ones, and then six a larger one for the for the older kids. Um, but the, nothing was ever defaced. You know how in public school, uh, maybe not in your school, but at my school, it used to be done <coughs> under the desk. <laughs> they never defaced anything. They were just so proud of their, their you know their school car and their teacher. Uh, there was never never any of that uh, going on, and. Um, Harvey and his sister, um, he talks about how on Saturday, uh, when there wasn't a class, uh, that was the day to clean the blackboards and uh, polish the floor or whatever. So his mom would put the wax on the floor and they'd put old socks on and they'd skate up and down <laughs> to, to polish. That's how that happened. Anyway, okay. So uh, the schools did have libraries and um, Sally and Dick and Jane is what we had, right? Yes. And they had married John and Peter. Um, and uh, books like uh, uh, The Call of the Wild would be uh, books that would be chosen um, for, the, for the library. And um, Chris, the youngest one of the Wright family, he said he, was, he read a lot because his, brothers, uh, his brother and sisters had already left home. So he, he just devoured the, the library. But and it, and it got changed on a fairly regular basis. Um, now this is, this is um, the Ontario Teacher's Manual, um, 1925. And um, teachers, I'm just gonna read you the first paragraph here. This handbook is primarily intended to assist in teaching the work in manual training outlined in the course of study for Forms 1 to 4. In those schools that are without special teachers and completely equipped manual training rooms, it should be remembered that the equipment suggested is not intended uh, for those schools where the accommodation is usually limited. It will be noticed that the work for each form is intended to cover two years of school life. Much more is included than can possibly uh, be accomplished in the limited time that is available. But this is done for the following reasons. To offer a variety of choice both to the teacher and to the pupil. After a certain amount of preliminary training and practice, the pupil should be allowed to choose the subject he is to make or to modify the design of the object assigned. Exercises that are chosen voluntarily are usually much better done than those that are prescribed. <laughs> <Duh. laughs> okay. Anybody remember doing weaving in, in school? Am I the only one that's old enough to remember that? Yeah. You had strips of paper and you learned how to weave? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, commu community work in uh, uh, work with paper, cardboard modeling. And then I put in the Halloween. Um, the, the cutouts making um, Halloween. So, 
Yeah, so that's a school card in winter. Um, I mean, the temperatures would be minus 45 and 55, and even lower sometimes. Um, so there's a picture. You can see Canadian Pacific. So it's really great that people did did take pictures, right? I mean, it enhances the story so much. Saturday evening post, Mr. Wright in his class, and I'll show you a, a closer uh, close-up picture of that. But this was this was rather interesting. Um, Canadian Pacific at that time. I mean, it had the the, um, the ships, it had the hotels, it had the railway. All kinds of um, uh, things were happening as far as Canadian Pacific was concerned. So they did this big, what do you call it, big spread in the Saturday Evening Post. And since uh, they had um, a school car that was originally a CP uh, passenger car, it became part of this article in 1948. So it's actually a color picture because that's, you know, it was colored in the magazine. Um, when I contacted uh, Saturday Evening Post, which, you know, they have somebody looking after their archives or whatever, I asked for permission to use this picture in the book, and they said, well, that'd be 500 US, please. <laughs> I said, oh, sorry, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> so it's not in the book. But uh, you can see, um, well, that, oh, okay, that's a, a map of um, Europe and North Africa. Yeah. But um, they had the usual pull-down maps with the chocolate bars in the corners. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you had, you had, well, teachers at that time had decided that they, you know, they wouldn't <coughs> stroke out, you know, color over the uh, chocolate bars that that was going to hang in the schoolroom, <laughs> uh, any class. But uh, pull-down maps and um, that was where, where the different uh, uh, children are. So 1959, um, the school teachers were awarded the VK Greer Award. Anybody that's a retired teacher know the name Greer? No? No, okay. Um, he, he was really a, a well-respected um, teacher, educator, and um, um, he, had, he had passed away and his, his wife uh, set up this award. So uh, they were all given training passes to come down to Toronto to go to the university and have this big uh, um, occasion where they uh, got their, their Greer Award. And as you can see, it wasn't a very big award. Each, each of them got about $60 <laughs> uh, and, a, and a, a, train, a train pass to come down. So uh, Fred Sloman, second from the left, is the book I'm working on uh, now. And uh, Mr. Wright, third from the right. Third from the right, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, there were two women that were teachers. Um, one, her husband died suddenly um, on the job, and she took over and taught for a couple of years. And the other lady that taught, um, and they were both qualified teachers, the other lady, um, her husband enlisted for military service in the Second World War, and so she taught while he was away. So this is what a, a timetable would have looked like, uh, showing the stops uh, along the way between uh, Chapeau and White River. You see the name uh, Nicholson, uh, Missanabe, Otter, Franz, um, Amyot, they, um, and every so often, if there wasn't students at, you know, this place, or there wasn't enough students at, at, at one stop, um, say there was just one child, then children would ride the freight train from where they did live to that particular stop so that all three of their children would get an education. So this is Chris uh, with his uh, bears. <laughs> And he said he figured out um, from the native children that you know you didn't get between the mother and the babies and you didn't do this or didn't do that. Um, he said he kind of lost his fear uh, about you know handling the, the, the bear cubs. So there he is in his class. Look at those ringlets on those girls. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> wow. So you can see he's got a, he's got his desk at the front, and um, 
in stitch in the children with the blackboard. Left handed. Yeah. Yeah, left handed. Not getting her hands slapped, eh? <laughs> um, actually, in this this picture up here, it's hard to tell, but that's actually um, uh, Dr. McDougall, the one that um, um, had the eureka moment about how to how to teach the children how to get education to them. Um, every school car had that picture hanging there. They they really uh, you know. He really thought he was a very special man, and he was. And I, I, I think he, had, I think that's a typewriter on his desk. I'm not sure. So um, they had a gramophone, and it was, of course, bolted to the floor. Everything was pretty much bolted to the floor uh, because there were accidents. Um, the freight train, you know, would, you know back in to hook on and, and move the, uh, the school car, and sometimes there would be some pretty nasty bumps. And they, you know, they, did, they did come across, you know, in, you know, you read in the book, uh, uh, train wrecks and, and whatnot. I mean, uh, what a place to have a playground, right? Railroad <laughs> tracks. Um, so, I mean, they were really warned about, um, you know, being so cautious about trains coming. Oh, and uh, I think it was Shirley said, if she heard uh, the bells of St. Mary's play now, she would hardly recognize it because it always seemed that the, you know, the gramophone would run down and the bells of St. Mary's got slower and slower. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how it looks in the museum. And um, it's um, one of the curators at the museum said it's one of the favorite things for for visitors to visit uh, when they're there. Now, these people had to uh, take their bed apart in the morning, put the sheets and the pillows and blankets away, and then uh, pull out the, the bunk bed, you know, whatever the setup was, and make the beds up again at night. And we complain about making beds in the morning, right? <laughs> so everything had to be put away so that there was room to move. It doesn't show it here, but every nook and cranny uh, held something that aided the teacher um, in his goal to, to teach the children about as many things as he possibly could. Um, it doesn't show the alphabet up uh, around either. Um, Mr. Wright cut out the letters of the alphabet, and uh, the one boy said that's, you know, lying in bed at night, that's how he learned his alphabet. It was all along the <laughs> Looks all, all very neat without anybody in there, doesn't it? Yeah. So there's a stove for you, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, carrying carrying the, the, the coal and keeping that going was one thing, but keeping the heating system in the car was really a challenge. Uh, if the pipes froze, uh, then the school car was out of commission and had to go to the, uh, the shops to be repaired. Uh, nobody got educated for two weeks. Um, everybody was disappointed. Everything was in an uproar. So they were warned, you know, don't let the pipes freeze. Um, but what, what a job it was. So um, the plan was to, to teach these immigrants um, to be proud that they were now living in Canada, they were learning English, um, you know, respect the flag and, you know, singing uh, God Save the King in the morning. All those things were all taken very seriously. Um, each morning, the flag was raised at the school car and then taken down at the end of the day. Uh, I, I think that just that paragraph about uh, education uh, is a state of mind. If a child can get to us, we can show a much easier way of unlocking doors. If we're merely able to call to him cheerfully, the miles of bush, he goes on unlock unlocking doors himself. So uh, I thought that was a really uh, good way to tell the importance of, of getting an education. So here he is uh, at the museum outside of Quebec. So if you happen to be a rail fan or you know someone who is, um, it's, a, it's a great museum to visit. Now, 
I've got something here that I'd like to read. <clears throat> Incidents are not rare to show that the school power is answering the insistent throw in inarticulate call of those who are in need. Two boys of nine and 11 years were discovered alone in a shack in the forest, orphaned by a mother and left by force of circumstance by their father to forage for themselves for the winter while he tended his trap lines far downstream toward Hudson Bay. The teacher chanced on them, picked them up and introduced them to the school car. Needless to say, they were open-eyed with amazement. <clears throat> As it was nearing Christmas, he played Santa Claus to them, outfitted them in clothing, sent by friends interested in the work, and kept them over the holiday season. These two had never known the real significance of the Christmas story. What a time these guests had. When they arrived, there was a well-stocked larder. When they left, the teacher had a visible version of the Mother Hubbard tale, but it did not end there. They found an old used tent, pitched it among the spreading spruce, banked it high with snow, thatched it with boughs, and actually lived in it through the dead of the northern winter in a temperature of 45 to 55 degrees below zero for the, for the weeks of the school car hauling <coughs> at Ramsey, 40 miles from their home. They made rapid progress and soon held their own with the best school of their age in the province. Another boy with the, the name and native aptitudes for life in the open uh, of our Indian cousins, when he heard of this new thing that, was, had, that had come to help him, packed his hamper with a week's food supply and set out on his lonely way 32 miles downstream to where the school car was stationed. What mattered is that his canoe was frozen in before he was halfway. He tied on his snowshoes and finished the trip. Another little section here. School car auxiliary. When the cars were first installed in 1926, a group of ladies in Toronto were very much interested in this project and the children of the North. Because of the remote distances, it is practically impossible for the parents to reach a far off shopping center. But through the generosity and thoughtfulness of this group, every child through, through the teacher receives Christmas cheer of some kind. Many a child's face brightens and life is made much happier because of the work being done by the auxiliary. So you've probably got hospital auxiliaries and, and whatnot here. Um, so women have been doing uh, a lot of good things for a lot of years. The work of the school car is unique in many ways. Every stop brings a new group of children. Nearly all have been brought up in the bush. Many have never seen a paved street, a stone, um, or a brick building, or a fr fruit tree in bloom. But they have seen a monarch in the glen, bears and deer, and they have heard the lonely howl of the wolf as he's called to his mate in the darkness of the night. They know the trees and the flowers and the songs of the birds, but there are many different things of which some know little, as shown by an incident related by one of the teachers. Olga at Bethnal had never seen a Christmas tree. She had to put one in the school early so that she could see it and have it lighted. We also sent her mother to the bush to bring in a bit of cedar, and when Olga's father came home from work at dark, he got quite excited putting tinsel on the tree in the low-roofed home. Olga's tree lights were three flashlight bulbs wrapped in colored cellophane, and they were hitched to a dry cell that belonged to a telephone. The switch to, the flash, the switch to flash them on and off for Santa Claus was made from a spring clothespin. <laughs> One does not need much imagination to see how Olga's face lighted up with the happiness at, at having a Christmas tree really her own. There can be no doubt <clears throat> that, the true, that the tree brought more delight to that little kitty than many uh, heavily laden multicolored Christmas trees bought, uh, to, brought to a child in a brownstone fronted home in some urban center. Each car has its own flag, and while the car is on its spur, the flag flies, an emblem to the 20 or more nationalities who attend these schools that 
<clears throat> that they now live in the land of opportunity where each child is given every chance for improvement and development into a good Canadian citizen. As one teacher has said, education is a state of mind. So I've, you know, I've got lots of things I can read you and, and give you snippets of this and that. I don't know how our time is, we're probably out of time. Um, but I, I'd love to answer questions. If I don't know the answers, I make them up. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and, and there, there were accidents. One of the one of the right girls, you know, got a broken leg, and they, and they had to wait for you know a train to you know come to you know take her off to um, to Chapel. and um, it was all very terrifying for her because she'd never been you know away from her parents and never been in the hospital, knew nothing of that, and, and it was really a scary thing for her. So. Uh, things that we think are, are pretty much every day and you know, can be fixed or whatever, um, not so the case. I mean, there was you know, lots of things that uh, were, were pretty difficult. Uh, yes, Sherry. Um, what about, uh, these, these were for the trained worker families, right, that set up stations along the tracks, right? That's yeah. For the most part, but are other kids allowed to join? Yeah, there was never a child turned away, you know, whether they were, you know, even if they were probably older than they should be, you know, for going to school, they were not turned away. If they wanted to learn, there was an opportunity. And although um, when the school was finished at, you know, middle, late afternoon, um, the, you know, the teacher had a bit of a break, but then uh, anybody that lived at that uh, mile post, you know, the foreman and, and his people that helped maintain the track, um, they thought this was a community center. <laughs> so they came in and uh, um, you know, usually the teacher's wife would you know, make some cookies and they'd have tea and coffee and they wanted to learn you know, to speak English and to be able to write their names. They, they couldn't advance with the, the rail company and get any higher position unless they could you know, read the orders and, and reply to the orders and sign their, you know, they couldn't even sign their checks, right? Um, so the teachers had a, a, a big a big class at night as well. And the one one teacher, not Mr. Wright, but one teacher said, you know, he just hated the game bingo. He said, oh, whoever created that game? But he said, and then a thousand blessings, a thousand blessings uh, because of it as well, because um, it was a game all ages could play. And, you know, it, you know, they were just so happy to have social contact with people. And, and, the, and the newspapers were dropped off. They were, you know, tossed with the mailbag from, you know, it might be two or three days later. What? But the newspapers were dropped off, and the teacher and his family, you know, read the news and, you know, and spread the news, right? They became the local paper uh, for the local people. So, um, lot, you know, the book is just full of, you know, all kinds of things that uh, um, give you the, the social aspect of, of what it was like living in what was then called New Ontario. It wasn't just Ontario or Northern Ontario, it was New Ontario. So uh, if um, I do have books for sale, if you're interested, they're $25 for On the Right Track. Uh, the other ones are, are a different price if anyone's interested. But um, yeah, I, I've been spending so much time still working on the farmerettes uh, that I haven't been getting as much done on the Sloman book, but uh, a truly amazing Canadian um, that people need to know his story. Uh, besides being a fabulous educator, he was a short story writer, both fiction and non-fiction. Um, he was a humanitarian. Nobody was ever turned away from his door. He was always, always there helping. Um, anyway, I've gone on too long. Yes. Yes. Um, the trains. I know a little bit about trains. So would they be on a side track then? Yeah, that's what they call the spur. Okay, because the other trains would be, especially the things that you call the people rings. Yeah. And so, the way I understand it, they lived in one car and taught in that same. Right, they had like one big room. They had you know, a swinging door between the uh, okay. between the class and the kitchen. And um, Chris, being the youngest, um, he could hear his mother helping in the kitchen, helping a student that needed a little extra attention. And he heard his mother say, one and one is two so many times that as soon as he heard one and one, he shared two. <laughs> <laughs> Who paid for this? Like the CPR or CNR or whoever? Yeah, the Department of Public Safety. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Department of Education paid the teacher and, and supplied the car with the, the desks and, okay. and the library and the maps, all those things. Um, uh, the Department of Education, I think, had to pay to have the spurs built. And CN needed to build like five spurs and CP didn't have that same problem, but the, the, they did supply the car and the, uh, arranged to have the spurs uh, put in place. Um, I never heard the call spurs, like we used to take the train to the school when I was a kid, CN. Um, but we would have to go, we, all of a sudden the train would be pulled onto a side track. <laughs> That's and right. A big freight would come through. Yeah. The passenger train always has, and they still do apparently, VIA still has to do that. Yeah. But I, I've never heard them call spurs. So. Yeah. So you can imagine you're the teacher, and all of a sudden, the transcontinental's going by. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can't teach, right? You know, everybody's, you know, more interested in the, and, and well, yeah. of course, the noise as well. But they're more interested, in, you know, who's going by. And, and you know, during the war, they would see uh, prisoners of war, German prisoners of war, you know, at the windows, pressing, you know, against the windows to see the school car. Um, you know, and then the freight trains would would go by, and you know there wasn't any. You know, I mean, they were. It wasn't like you were in Switzerland where everything you know happened at the exact time it was supposed to happen. Uh, they would come by, and uh, um, teaching would stop again, right? They didn't. They didn't go out at recess because it, you know they you know they would kick the ball around before and, and after school maybe, but they didn't go out to you know play at recess because of the danger of the trains. Mm -hmm. But the parents didn't have to pay for that education. No, no. Public education. Yeah. Every, every child, 8 to 14, was to be given an education. That was the, the act in 1871, that they were to be given an education in a government-inspected school. So the inspectors came and checked that everything was going well. Yes? We used to live in Chapel. Oh my goodness. <laughs> In Shapo is, is on the main line of the C CPR. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it's in, it isn't any wonder to me why they chose Chapel as the hub, because there's also the round table there, the round house there where they did all the maintenance oh, yeah. and repairs and the trains. Yeah. And it, it connected most of the communities in that part of the north. So it's, it's not surprising that that's where the hub would be. And it's, it, you know, Hearing those names again brought back a lot of memories. <laughs> well, um, if you haven't seen the program on TV, oh, I think I have that up there, right? Uh, Tripping one train 185. If you haven't seen that, I, you know you would enjoy it. Um, and you don't have to watch it all at once, but it takes you right from Sudbury in the Bud Car all the way up to White River, and then you you rent a room from the mayor who has a motel there, and then you go back the next day. <laughs> Uh, but the scenery is fabulous. The um, and little tidbits of history, yeah. you know, along the way. Um, you can just read it on the screen. You, there's no one telling you the history, but you know, it talks about the, the Chapel Game Preserve, that sort of thing. So, the Game Preserve is. It's my understanding the Game Preserve is the largest in the world. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's what I understand as well. well. Yeah. And it's something most Canadians don't know about. No. That's right. It's not well marked. Yes, Jerry. Bonnie, I wanted um, at one of the other presentations that I heard you give um, <laughs> the switch between a home and school, like the one little guy, Big Lee, hit back the sun, one of the rights. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, Harvey, the, 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 the one that I actually got to meet face to face, um, he, he knew that if he showed up late, come through the swinging door, that you know, he was kind of in trouble. And every so often he would get absorbed in what he was doing at the, you know, after the breakfast dishes were taken away, he was still working at the, at the table, and then you know, all of a sudden you hear them singing, you know, God save the king or you know, whatever, and he knew, oh, well, I, gotta, I gotta get in there, and you know, dad's gonna be pretty unhappy that his, his own son didn't show up to school on time. <laughs> so, um, just, you know, everyday things that, that they experienced, um, like he, he made, Harvey made his own, um, uh, stilts, yeah, that's what you call them, right? Stilts. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you know, he, he mastered them, and then he decided he would he would go to one of maybe the foreman's house, and he would take these stilts and he'd walk up 
up the stairs out of the front porch type of thing. And then he said, if his mother was looking up, she must have been having a fit because then he could turn around and you know go down the steps on the stilts. But I mean, I mean, they went looking for garbage, you know, see what they could find at the garbage dump. Um, they picked blueberries and, and shipped them down to Campbellford to, you know, for their grandpa to sell the blueberries and send the money back to them. And one year, Harvey bought a sleigh because he had enough money. One of the letters that, that Harvey wrote uh, to, I was maybe an aunt and uncle or maybe even grandparents, <laughs> talking about the uh, carnival, the winter carnival in Chapelot. And he was like 12 or 13 at the time, and his handwritten letter is in the book. Uh, and the description is just wonderful. You know, talked about what he saw in the parade, talked about the figure skaters, he talked about the people playing hockey or whatever, just a fabulous description. And I think you'd have to go far and wide to find a, a 12 or 13 year old boy now that would do that. You know, and it's just it was a, a totally different time. And uh, the social history is really interesting. <coughs> and I hated to see it lost. Yeah. They did a lot of ice sculpting too. Yeah. 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 Beautiful, Huge beautiful ones, yeah. 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 Uh, Yes? Uh, at any given time, how many school cards were there in, in Northern Ontario? There were seven. Oh, it's with the seven spur lines. Yeah. One on each. Oh no, seven, seven, seven lines. Like yeah. uh, that. This was Shallow to White River, but the small ones were um, Capriol to Foliette. Okay. Um, when when Mr. Wright started out, he he started uh, at the Fort William end of uh, Toronto, you know, or Toronto, Ontario, and you know, Kenora that that route. But um, yeah, there was um, yeah. The, Six-month experiment that lasted a lot, you know, from 1926 to 1967. That's a great experiment. <laughs> did they did they miss any kids? Like the cars were always full, but when you think of the population that could be educated, uh, did they miss a, a good portion of the children? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, uh, talking to you know to people who did go to the schools. And, and hearing that, you know, if it was two miles into the bush where they lived, they, they walked out the two miles and then, they, and then they followed the track. I mean, sometimes, you know, in, in the spring, they, you know, they came by canoe if there were a big distance. Sometimes in the winter, snowshoes and dog sleds, you know. Um, there was a lot of walking involved. Because they were just, they were just little, little mini settlements of whoever was standing yeah, like at a, at a mile post where the foreman was there. Um, you know, making sure that the track was safe. Um, the foreman had a house, and, and maybe there was, you know, maybe there was two other cabins. But one family might have five children. You know, one month, and one family might have six or two, whatever. So it was a real, a real mix up. And then if that man got another job, <coughs> CN or CP, he moved someplace else. So all of a sudden, he didn't have that that same group the next year. Thank you very, very much. Let's yeah. give her a hand. Yes.